If you want to, you can go ahead and turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Mark. As we continue on in Mark, we're going to be looking this morning at the miracles or the healing works of God. And we're going to go back through Mark, which we've been in for the last month or so. And we're going to touch on several things. In fact, there's, there's 15 miracles, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to touch on all of them this morning. We got through 13 at the 9 o'clock service before it got too late. And um, this morning, uh, I want to begin by talking to you about something that's called perceptual vigilance. Has anyone ever heard the title or the term perceptual vigilance? Perceptual vigilance is something that we use quite often in our life. And what I find is, Dana, I'm very unique in certain ways. And so are you and everyone else that's in here. And sometimes I sit and I try to think within myself how to, how to explain how I feel about certain things or why I do the things that I do. And most of the time I come up blank. I can't define the things that I do or why I do these things. Uh, sometimes, you know, I have uh, defined some of the things I do by uh, different medical terms or, or letters like ADD or ADHD or OCD and all those wonderful things that are out there. Uh, in fact, I apologized to my wife yesterday for... Uh, being so OCD sometimes <clears throat> because it makes it rough because you become critical of certain things when you're that way. And we were talking about something as simple as when the toilet paper goes on the toilet paper holder, does the toilet paper go under or over? And right-handed people go over, left-handed people go under. And I told her that I noticed stuff like that because I am that way. So now you are glad you don't work with me every day or live in the house with me. But that's just how I am. But perceptual vigilance, I have to start with a story. And I thank Pastor Mark Batterson for sharing this story because it helps us to put things into perspective. He says, I recently read a fascinating study involving a group of Americans who had never been to Mexico and a group of Mexicans that had never been to America. And he said, uh, researchers built a binocular viewing machine capable of showing one image to the right eye and another image to the left eye. So this is... This is something that you look into like binoculars, but the right eye shows one picture and the left eye shows another picture. Picture that. And he says, one of the snapshots was of a baseball game, which is an American pastime, right? Um, and then the other eye looked at bullfighting, which is a Mexican pastime. And he said, as they did the test, the pictures would appear at the same time, forcing the subject, whether they be from Mexico or whether they be from America, to look at the pictures and to focus on them. And when asked what they saw, what did the American subject see? They saw baseball. And the people from Mexico that participated, what did they see? They saw bullfighting. Now you might say, well, how can that be? Because they can see baseball in the right eye, bullfighting in the left eye. But depending on the country that they came from or the culture that they come from, that is the picture that they saw. That is what they identified with. And he came to the conclusion that seeing is believing. But the opposite is true as well. 
And that is believing is seeing. And to define that a little bit more, if we think about perceptual vigilance, our perceptions are greatly affected by our experiences, by our education, and by our expectations. What we see depends upon what we have experienced or what we have not experienced. Have you ever heard about some really amazing things that God does in other houses of worship that you think to yourself, I've never experienced that before or I've never seen that before. And we worry, uh, not worry, but we wonder to ourselves, why does that only happen there? It's because it comes down to belief. It comes down to those people have experienced those things. So therefore they can see things that possibly people who worship here may not see. So when we think about these things like this and perceptual vigilance coming down to depending on what we've experienced and what we have not experienced... It also affects the way that we believe in worship. It also affects in the way that we read the Bible. It affects the way that we live our life and what we think God is capable of doing through us or the lack of what he can do through us because of perceptual vigilance. So as I stand here this morning, I would like to believe that everybody in here believed the very same way that I believe, but I know that that is not true. In fact, there are people perhaps in this church and in other churches as well that don't even believe in the miracles of Jesus. They don't even believe in the faith healings of Jesus. There are people that believe that Jesus could heal people, but they believe that the healing stopped at Jesus. They don't go on to read the scripture about Jesus sending out the disciples and the disciples coming back and telling Jesus about the people that were healed physically, people who come to know Jesus and the demons and devils that were cast out by people that God or Jesus had empowered. And certainly, if we don't live in a culture where we see people being healed through belief or through faith, we start to lose the thought that God could use us for those purposes, don't we? I mean, if someone came in here right now and they had some type of um, physical ailment, let's just say leprosy, which is one of the scriptures we'll look at today. How many of us have the level of faith that we would think that the Holy Spirit could move through us if God chose that to come up and say a simple word to that person? As Jesus will in this scripture, he says, hold out your hands. When the guy holds his hands out, the leprosy has gone. What if a, a leper came down and God spoke through his Holy Spirit through you or for, through I and we believe that there was absolutely no way that Jesus wasn't going to answer this prayer. And we just thought within ourselves, I feel God's Spirit. He is telling me this is what I need to say over this situation. This is the prayer I need to pray. And we'll see how Jesus' prayers were short. And this person could be healed. You see, we don't see that all the time. So I think sometimes because of this perceptual vigilance, we don't think it can happen. So we limit God in the things that he can use us for. In fact, I told the story this morning that in a previous church that we pastored, I just took for granted, Bruce, that everyone could hear God's voice. So I'm teaching a discipleship class one morning, and I'm surrounded by people who've been in church all their life. They're a lot older than I am. And I start talking about hearing God's voice because when you're a pastor, 
you have to realize that whatever you want to say yourself means nothing. What God wants to say through you means something special. And you have to put yourself into a place where you hear from God so that you know what to say to this particular group of people on this particular day. And on that particular day, taking for granted that everyone could hear God's voice, I said to them, can someone tell me when you last heard God's voice, what did he say? And they all looked at me rather strangely. And they said, I don't think I've ever heard God's voice. And I think sometimes we take those things for granted. We understand things differently because we have experienced things differently. Jesus' disciples did things differently after the day of Pentecost, Dan, because they had experienced God in a different way. So as we look at these scriptures in Mark, we need to understand a couple things. One is, is God limited? Yes or no? He has no limits, right? All right. And we know by reading God's word that he can do great and miraculous things, can he? I mean, we're going to read a few of them here in Mark this morning. So if anything is going to limit a movement of God, who or what is that going to be? It's going to be me. It's going to be my ability to say that it's possible. Because one thing that I know is just because I've not experienced something does not mean that it's not true. There's a place up in the mountains that I would like to go to because evidently something is messed up with gravity and things go backwards. Has anyone ever been there? It's called Mystery Hill or something like that. All right. And, and things are supposed to roll the opposite way which kind of stretches my mind because, you know, we, we take all these classes that teaches us if you throw something up, it's got to come down, right? So evidently there, if something is expected to roll downhill, it rolls uphill. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. A few people are shaking their head that they've been there. But just because I haven't been there, I can't say, there's nothing to that just because I don't know it myself, right? So this morning, I want you to open up your mind. I want you to ponder in your heart if the Holy Spirit of God called on me today to do some of the same things that he endowed Jesus to do in this scripture. First of all, would we be willing to do it? Second of all, would our trust be in ourselves? And would we, like the Gentiles, like Jesus said, don't pray like the Gentiles or the heathens with repetition and have these long, drawn-out prayers? Because if you took the words that Jesus spoke in these 15 different scriptures, Brianna, he probably didn't say more in these 15 different uh, scriptures than what we say in one prayer we, we can pray a whole long prayer longer than what Jesus said in those 15 he, he just spoke to the situation and as we read these I want you to think so the first one is in Mark chapter 1 and I'm going to read a couple of these before I bring out any other thoughts on this because um, I'm getting behind here it says Mark uh, in 1 23 26 it says, now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. 
And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Notice how Jesus just simply said, be quiet and come out of him. He didn't have this long drawn out prayer as we do sometimes when we lay hands on someone and, or we anoint someone with oil. He simply spoke to what was unclean in the man and it came out. In Mark chapter 1, verses 30 through 31, we find another uh, situation where sometimes just through a touch. I have been with people before, and my hand, most of the time, my hands are kind of cold. They're kind of chilly or clammy. Julie will sometimes, Julie will sometimes say, your hands are cold. But sometimes when I begin to pray with people, I feel a burning heat in the palm of my hand. Sometimes when I touch people. And um, sometimes God tells me to touch a person. And there will be an intense heat that will come through my hand. And I can't explain that uh, other than being directed by God to do so. Uh, That happened with my dad when he had cancer. But one of the things that I want you to see is when Jesus didn't speak healing, sometimes he just touched a person and they were healed. It says, so he came, this is Peter's mother-in-law. So he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she served them. So we see Jesus with authority speaking to the the demonic we see Jesus with authority just knowing who he was and where his power came from and just reaching down and helping Peter's mother-in-law up and automatically the fever was gone then in 32 it says at evening when the sun had set they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak. And I find this quite interesting because they knew him. We know that when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven, there was a great bit of angels that were thrown out of heaven with him they were created by God and it says here that he did not allow them to speak but they knew him they knew who he was and we find here that Jesus is healing everyone that they are bringing to him and he does this with a certain authority now look with me in verses 40 through 42 of that first chapter It says, now a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus moved with compassion and stretched out his hand and touched him. See, all Jesus did. At first, Jesus took time. Jesus listened to the issue at hand. And then he did something that many of us really need to work on. He had compassion for this man. And it says that he touched him and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. Now, Patricia, that's a lot different than what we do in our our churches nowadays. If someone comes forth and they have an ailment, we'll spend 15 minutes praying over the ailment. And Jesus just says, I am willing. And he simply says, be cleansed with authority. And it says, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. We we think that these things don't happen in the day and time we live in. and, And I'll tell you one of the reasons why. Preachers used to preach on this a lot. Because everyone has two or three in their home. But I will use this illustration of something that happened in my own life. I had two volunteers. One, his name was Mark. The other was Robert. 
All right. Mark is a welder. And Mark had been in Afghanistan uh, doing a welding contract for the U.S. government. And he came back to the United States. And when he got back, there was a past that he was running from. He had just become a believer in Jesus Christ. He was teamed up with this older man by the name of Robert. And they came to me at the assisted living I worked at at the time. And they said, we'd like to volunteer. And I said, well, what would you like to do? Well, they just wanted to sit down with the people and just talk with them. Because they said, you know, when people get into their 80s and their 90s, what is neglected? Most of the time, it's just time and conversation. So that's what we did. They would come and they would sit and they would talk with a whole living room, mostly of ladies, because ladies like to be with the guys and the guys like to be with the ladies. It's just the way it is. And they would tell stories. Well, on this particular day, they had gone to another assisted living where a Vietnam veteran lay in the bed and he had lost his limbs in the war. And they were with him when they noticed, Dan, that this man was talking in one voice one time, and then another voice started coming out of this man. And then there were certain things that were happening to this man, manifestations of different facial expressions and his attitude, you know, just being off the chart, changing. And they come to the conclusion that this man was possessed. They went to the man's room one day, and they laid hands on him, and they prayed over him, and he began to be loosed of a demon that was inside of him. How long he had had this, I don't know. But they said that it felt as though when they prayed that something was pushing them down, trying to push them away from him, and he was screaming out in a voice that was not his. And then there was something that moved about the room, something really dark. And they were telling this to the ladies in the group at my assisted living about what God had done and what God had used them for. And really extreme, right? And my director at that time was a young man. He had not been out of the army very long as a surgeon in the military. And he heard about it, and he was asking me. He said, they can't do what they said that they did. I said, well, why can't they? He says, don't they know evangelicals and Protestants, they can't deliver anyone from a demon. On TV, only the Catholics can do that. <laughs> and we're talking about perception here, right? So one of the things that he perceived is that you had to be a priest, first of all, and you had to be only Catholic before the Lord could use you to loose someone from something that was demonic. And we laugh about that, but you see, he had not experienced that before. And when we read these things about Jesus, sometimes we remove ourselves so far away from these things because we've never seen it happen before. We're just like what he said. Only certain people can do it. Only the preacher can do that. You got to know so much scripture. You got to know the right words. No, you have to make yourself available. And first of all, the Spirit of God has to want to want to use you so as we think about those things are you willing to be used even in these extreme cases in mark chapter 2 listen from verses 3 through 5 this is a man that was paralyzed then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men and when they could not come near him because of the crowd they uncovered the roof where he was so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. 
And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But in verse 9, Jesus says, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Now, I've not been able to go into New Hanover Regional Medical Center in over a year now. Because even as a chaplain for the hospital, I've not had permission. COVID's kept me out solid. But I have walked through those halls so many times. And you know what I have thought to myself? Wouldn't it be awesome if the Holy Spirit of God came upon me and I got to walk into people's rooms and say, take up your clothes, put them on, and go home because you're healed. You don't owe this place nothing. Oh, how I would love to be able to do that. Wouldn't you? To bring hope into people's lives that way. To be gifted of God that way. Even if only in that moment, Chris. You ever visited a grandparent when they're in the hospital? It's like the last place they want to be. They want to be at home, sitting in that recliner. That they hit that button and their feet go up and they're back. And it stands them up when they want to get up and... Nothing like being there with their plants and their dogs and their flowers and all that. Hospital, Susie, is the last place they want to be. To bring that hope into people's lives like Jesus did. Well, first we have to put ourselves into the situation. Because most of the time we don't even know if there's anyone that has anything wrong. If there's anyone that is unclean if there's anyone that has any of these problems we're talking about but Jesus tries to show us through example here as we read about his life look with me in chapter 5 all these different examples of how he being God man was empowered by God to bring healing into the lives of these people Now, if I had only read in the scriptures that Jesus was the only one that did this, I wouldn't be preaching this to you today. But when I read that Jesus empowered his disciples who were filled with his spirit to be able to do these same things. This morning we just sat in the other room in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we read about us being the temple of God and the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You know what that tells me? It tells me that if God can use his disciples in that way, why can't he use me that way? Why can't he use you that way? So I'm encouraged when I read these things that Jesus did. One of my favorites, because I have daughters, comes from Mark 5, 37 through 42. And this is when Jesus heals this little girl says here in verse 37, And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And it says that they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand, once again a touch, and he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked. She was 12 years of age. Little girl, wake up. 
Very few words that Jesus spoke in these situations. I want you to see that we get lulled into these long prayers. It's as though we're at a pep rally sometimes when someone has an ailment. Sometimes we think, well, a person can't be healed unless they're anointed with oil. No. No. I haven't yet seen Jesus apply any oil. Have you? Even though we know oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, we see him touching them or saying just a few words. I am willing. Be cleansed. Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Be quiet and come out of him. Stretch out your hand. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Very few things when you believe that it can happen. This, one of my favorites, because I've always wanted to do this. And y'all are going to say, yep, that's you, mischievous. Look with me in Mark 8. You ever wanted to perhaps do the thing where Jesus spit in the dirt, he made a paste, and then he stuck it on somebody's eyes? Well, in this particular scripture, there's not even a dirt added. It just says he spit on the person's eyes. Listen to this, Mark 8, 22 through 25. We're so politically correct. We're so smug in the way we go about things. We got to have pills. We got to have shots for people to get healing today. That's what we have believed. That's what we see working sometimes. But listen to what Jesus did here. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. This tells us a couple things. First of all, those who really desire what Jesus can do, they're not going to say no to hardly anything. Jesus, whether he made paste and put it on his eyes, whether it was just spit and it was on the man's eyes, what is more important for the man to see or for him to have a clean face? But I also want you to see that sometimes when we pray with people, we, let, we feel led to pray with people, and we only pray with them one time, and we expect a healing to come. We see even in this scripture with Jesus praying with this man, he prayed with him twice before he was able to see. In fact, look here with me. It says, and after he had looked, and it looked like trees walking, he couldn't see. Then in verse 25, it says, Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everything clearly. And then he sent him away to his house. Spit on his eyes and he touched him. Well, for the sake of time this morning, Mark chapter 9 there is a person that Jesus encounters that can't hear and he can't speak. Why? There's a spirit inside of this person. And Jesus commands the deaf and the dumb spirit to come out of him and to enter him no more. And lastly, in Mark chapter 10, turn with me there. Verse 46. How many of you have read that scripture where Jesus says that, that there will be those that do even greater things than he did? I have. Now I know within my own self there is no power to do anything. Half the time there's no, even, there's no power to even think. Much less do something like we're reading here. But we all said in the beginning that God's power is not limited. And where he wants to use his power, there's no limits there either. So we have the man that we call blind Bartimaeus here in this scripture. 
Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. I want you to see that the faith there. Believing is seeing. He believed and therefore he was getting ready to see. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni or teacher, that I may receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now, after reading these scriptures about Jesus and the very few words that Jesus said, where do we get the idea of all of these lengthy prayers that we have to pray louder than everybody else for something to happen? Or we have to pray longer than everyone else for something to happen? Or that we have to somehow come up with the right words for something to happen. Because Jesus clearly gives us an example here with only a few words that when God is willing and Jesus was able because of that, that great things happened. Now, we've talked a lot today about us being able to possibly be given something from the Holy Spirit to help other people. But let's flip that over. Maybe today you have come and you don't believe that Jesus can do anything to help you anymore. Maybe you're dealing with something and you've listened to other people that don't know about what we've read today. And maybe because you now believe the way that they believe, you don't believe that your life can be any better. You've just kind of settled for what's going on in your life. Maybe you've lost all hope because of that. I want you to understand today that there are no limits with Jesus. Yes, sometimes Jesus will allow us to suffer so that we might do his will and his work. Not everyone receives healing. Some people, unfortunately, are more effective witnesses for the Lord when they're in pain and when they're suffering than what they might be if they were whole. And that's unfortunate to say that because we want everyone to be whole. But what happens to us when everything seems to be going Great. Sometimes we forget about God, don't we? But when we need Him, and He is a constant reminder that we need Him, then we come to Him for our need. So this morning as we all stand, whether you're the person that has the perceptual vigilance applied to you that maybe you have studied that it don't exist. Your education tells you, don't believe it. Or maybe you're the one that you've never seen something like that happen before. You know, a couple Sundays ago, I shared with you that over in uh, Israel, over in Afghanistan, over in Iraq right now, that people are dreaming dreams. They're seeing visions. Jesus is coming to people in their dreams. People are being healed. I talked to you about 
one pastor that laid hands on someone that had a growth on the side of their face or huge swelling. And he prayed three times with the lady and the swelling totally disappeared. And maybe we're just saying that don't happen in America anymore. The reason why it doesn't is because we don't believe. We live by the seeing is believing instead of the believing is seeing. Maybe this morning we need to ask God to give us his eyes. First of all, so that we might have compassion for other people. Maybe we need to ask him to give us his heart. So that we take the time and we feel for other people that need help. But then maybe there's someone here this morning. <clears throat> and maybe you've just about gave up on what's going on with you. And maybe you just want to ask God another time. Lord, do you want to heal me today? And maybe today is the day that Jesus might want to do that. So as the music plays today, if you need prayer, I'll be here at the altar. We'll switch this off and we'll pray. If, if today is the day that God wants to remove that.